So what I was thinking was really my, uh, well, two layers. First, I was thinking, wow, that's amazing. I've already, Kate Beer, you already know that I'm amazed at Medicare and I've been, you know, learning about that process as well. And it felt, there just felt like this strong synergy and resonance. And so what I was thinking, particularly we're thinking about this as the Rosetta Stone conversation was trying to start thinking as uh, one, just Dion, having you describe what's going on, what's the language, what's the discourse, what are the things that people are caring about, the value, success criteria in this palliative care movement. Mm. Uh, and then what I was thinking is uh, Kabir could kind of frame and discuss what he's thinking about from Medicare. And in particular, see if we can start finding the linkages of words, of concepts, of virtues, of lessons, of, of lived experiences. Um, because I think this, that as I kind of brought up when I was first kind of just reflecting was sort of, this is a lived experience problem. But then when I was reading your email, I was like, huh, there might be some more people who we want to talk to who have the lived experiences we need who, so that that actually allows Kabir to communicate more effectively. And so I, I really wanted us to try to spend this time to find those words so that, that the communication can be more powerful, meaningful, and impactful to allow more people to engage in Medicare. That's sort of where my head was at. I think that's wonderful. Um, and I really appreciate it. Sorry, Kabir, do you have anything to add to that in your, oh, how I, do you I'm see just, this? I'm just trying to open the, uh, not in the negative sense, but the black hole in my being. <laughs> I putting all of this in. There's... I love that. <laughs> Do you want a, a minute? Should we? No, no, let the, okay. Here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just holding space in my breath so that, I mean, there's a lot to this and I can't wait to hear more. Ah, yeah. oh, Jessica. <gasps> Yay. Good to see you, Jessica. Hello. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I didn't know you would be. No, I don't have to write an email. <laughs> <laughs> so, Speaking of email, I suck at it. So I've been trying to catch up with the conversation. And then like late last night, I was like, oh, there's an event. Okay, I'm going to come and catch up and, and participate. So, okay. Yeah, so we're, we were just about to start with sort of our, this is the Rosetta Stone conversation. And so the short summary is dayan has been uh, learning and engaging and, and uh, working in palliative care particularly the sort of framing as it's moving, which is just amazing and remarkable. And when I, when I was reading it and just sort of thinking about my experiences with Kabir and his work on Medicare, it felt like there was just deep resonance and synergy, but that the, the languages and words and live, and like, I think there's, there, there might be some shared lived experiences, but different ways of communicating those ideas. And so the idea was to try to build a space where the words could be start to unified, particularly I'm thinking for Kabir to help him in terms of communicating what he is doing with Medicare as it relates to palliative care, but then also make the distinctions when, when in, they are appropriate and relevant and whatnot, and sort of the added lessons and learned and whatnot. And so I think what we were just about to do was have Dion to start sharing what she's been thinking and uh, uh, and and what what basically and really Dion, it's okay to just be stream of conscious. Like these are the kind of this is the kind of conversations I'm I'm involved in, and this is the stuff I'm hearing. This is the stuff that matters to people. These are the values. These seem to be what people how people know that success is happening. This is like the insights people are learning from care. My hope would be you just kind of share and go free form. I'm going to be taking notes and I see we're recording it. And, and then my thought would be we flip it and then Kabir sort of offers his experiences. Like what did he hear that resonated? What are the words that he uses that might be different? And we start probing on similarities and differences uh, as we move forward in this space to sort of try to build this lexicon together. How's that sound? Yes. Um, Jessica, just to fill out a little more understanding for me, um, can I hear more about your specific interests and um, like even just joining this conversation? I mean, mostly I want to be able to, I, mostly I want to help Kabir in any way I can. That's mostly why I'm here. So, and then, you know, the, this, this idea of changing, changing the way we talk about healthcare and this being a really concrete example, I find really exciting. But you, I think I, I have to catch up on this conversation a little bit because I don't know very much about Medicare. I don't know much about palliative care. I don't know anything about palliative care, except the, um, except the root of the name. 
I know a little bit about, but can you share like, that? I don't. Yeah, it's it's something like, um, you know, like the, this. There was like some development of the culture of medicine at some point. My my boyfriend being in in residency uh he also like loves etymology and the like source definition of, of words and he um he said that palliative care is something like you know us gods really can't do anything anymore so you know let's hand it off to this like other you know like category of care <laughs> so it's kind of actually like in a way, like a misnomer, because there's so much more that can be done in that space than maybe has been done. But maybe you can t tell me otherwise. Maybe that has evolved and changed. No, I think that's great. And um, I feel like I have skipped over some, you know, sort of formal etymology at one point, but I don't recall what that was exactly. So I'm going to look up and see what I can find. I love starting there. I am um, by no means a etymologist, but I really appreciate it when I um, dig in sometimes. So I love that here. I mean, I'd love to hear what Yuri says to, um, you know, it, d during his training and, you know, how it's come about both from initial presentation to how palliative care services have been used um, as he's in hospital or clinic. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think I tried to convey on the email, but I'll just say it again here. This is a pretty pretty big cultural change in medicine for sure. Um, I can't speak, of course, you know, earlier than 20 years ago. I started medical school in 2002. So um, at that time, it was sort of the beginning of the big cultural shift. And it was really presented to me as um, trying to discern or differentiate and make it very strongly known that palliative care does not equal hospice and neither palliative care nor hospice equals, we're not gonna do anything and just let you die. And furthermore, while there is the sort of um, implication, if not you know, overt acceptance that hospice is, you know, it, it's not, it is definitely not a, a, a terminal, you know, a concrete terminal designation, but palliative care um, was often confused with that and the, the presentation to me was really emphasizing it absolutely is not that. And in many cases, people are um, prescribed or offered palliative care services um, as a, a temporary, you know, at very much under the premise that this is temporary and there is life after that. So, um, you know, to me, I think just in terms of of the name, I definitely had a bit of misunderstanding about what that meant. And then fortunately at OHSU it was a very well respected, um, and I would say in the sort of leading edge of institutions in terms of um, medical education and postgraduate um, specialty services, even around um, it being a discipline that not only um, is hugely beneficial for patients that need it, um, at the time that they need it, but has is in the position to influence all of the rest of the disciplines by its um, its own virtues and values and ways it administers care. And so those kind of basic premises, which I will, you know, share my understanding at the moment about that. But I I want to disclaim it by saying I am by no means an expert and I would love the opportunity after this conversation to sort of give you kind of the formalized um, what's what's currently accepted around this and that for people who really know what they're talking about in, in research, et cetera. I think, you know, that email was a bit of an overview, but there's definitely tons of great research going on now that can, um, you know, make, make sure that's more accurate and precise and contemporary. So, um, so I'll share a little bit, you know, about, about that sort of value system. And, and I think that is what's most aligned with Medicare or sort of what resonated with me on a intuitive and just very um, uh, brief or scant conceptual level. So I was actually going to ask you to start with Medicare first, because I mean, I'll, I'll share a little bit what I know, but, but I think, um, this is really important for Medicare, for just exactly as you say, Eric, for, for taking a lot of these concepts that are difficult to put language on 
and um, turning them into really concrete uh, concepts and um, items, I guess, and um, things that we can communicate, but also um, Tyler uh, laid out really nicely, you know, her being a super process oriented person, um, even copied and pasted exactly what she wrote so I could get it right. But it was basically, you know, creating this list of what are the components, what, what makes up a Medicare um, system and, and how do we, you know, start building that actual infrastructure early on. So I'm hoping, you know, we can do that here, at least start a bit of the framework there. I can share a bit about what I know about how palliative care does that. And first and foremost is in-home services, which is, you know, just easy. Um, you don't go, there's no like palliative care unit on the, in the hospital, for example, um, or usually not. I've been in a, a many hospitals <laughs> for a while, a few, but not a ton. Um, so, you know, there, I think, getting those practical things also started to map out is, is a good way to begin. And then um, we can all of that stuff, like try to flush, flush it in. How does that sound? That sounds great. And I think I appreciate your flip now to Kabir. And I think that probably is the right thing. We start building resonance of talking through. And Mike, welcome. Good, good timing. We we're just sort of agenda setting and staging. Um, and I think we're, Kabir, just to kind of continue to flow with it, I, maybe you can start, what are you, just tell us about the value system process, like help everyone to kind of get into Medicare, particularly in terms of the key things that, that you really want us to try to be conveying and feeling and understanding right now. I really appreciate it. And, and um, you know, Dion, one of the things I'm most grateful about your being here is that you, in my eyes, uh, you know, have such a practical grounding. I mean, you you've done so much work um, aligning yourself with the existing structures and systems in a practical, meaningful way. So we speak those languages and you perform in those paradigms. And, um, and so that's like such a tremendous value to me right now. I'm really just grateful that you've come to have this conversation for that reason, as well as countless others. And thank you all of you for being here. Um, you know, in contrast to that, I have no degrees and no professional history to speak of, and um, and it, in a sense, entirely impractical. And at the other end, um, the, the, it's so practical that we're dealing with how I get out of bed in the morning and make it to this call. As a matter of fact, um, did. Any of you get a chance to read the Systems Entrepreneurship, a Conceptual Substantiation of a Novel enter Entrepreneurial Species article that I sent out recently? I have not. Um, to be frank, what I tend to do with, with uh, emails from this group is I hit snooze to a moment until I know and I have time to put mental thought into it because I, I want to give proper thought to it. And by the way, Jessica, that's how I handled my inbox. So it's like, oh, okay. I know when I want to talk about that, I'm going to hit the time and then it just disappears for a while. So that one got into my snooze until Friday afternoon talk. <laughs> so sorry, I have not made it. It, it. it starts on the, you know, one of the things I've been clinging to for two or three decades is um, this idea that by avoiding the modern paradigms and structures of education and um, and career and these things, I've, 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 I've stayed in a sense virgin for what's coming next. So that I don't have a lot of unpacking of trained ideas and patterns to do to meet some future moment. And um, this article um, that I send out, it, it's talking about systems entrepreneurship. And um, I forget what the DIS one is, but and it's, not, it's, not, it's not a term I was familiar with before the article, but it spoke a lot to kind of what I'm looking at and what I'm seeing. Um, one thing I sent out last year or something was a project called the World Peace Initiative, which is looking at how do we, how do we do an intervention at the social scale that 
has the potential to, 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 to bind the soil of humanity across the planet like mycelium binds soil in a forest. And what I think makes Metacare really profound is, is the meeting of David Clemens and I, where I'm really out in this like, how do I stay as uneducated as possible so that I can help build a future that's not dependent on the levels of thinking that creating the problems we're trying to escape. And David's longtime meditative practice of chop wood, carry water. And so David has this wide scale capacity. He helped grow the field of entrepreneur, of, uh, of uh, volunteerism globally, which is a huge industry. Um, but at the same time, when it comes to caregiving, for his mother before me and then for our friend's father, both of those were more hospice situations. Um, and then for me and now today with his father, which is a bit of a palliative and, and, and hospice kind of a situation. It's about the, you know, how do you fold the linens in the closet? You know, how often do you sweep the kitchen? Just practical, practical, practical kind of to-do list sorts of things. And he's structured our Trello platform, which is the, the software we use right now is team communication and, and uh, kind of daily orientation process um, in addition to just a simple software to-do list. Um, so we've got those two ends of the spectrum that, that really synergize and are always in dynamic because David and I will sit and talk and we'll talk about like how do we properly build a grocery list? How do we maintain it? How do we keep it updated? How do we make sure that, the, that there's always food in the fridge for anybody that's here that might be hungry? And then um, also, how do we think about future generations and how are we contributing today to something that, that has a trajectory that's worth sending that far into the future. Um, and then in, 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 in real time, more locally, as we are going through this recent process of trying to restructure some ground here, I'm finding a lot of the conversations I'm in with the people that are here now are very dependent on me and my personal inclination and my history my interest in human development. And so the, when somebody comes here and they're learning to keep the house clean, we're also talking about their habits in the world and their practices in their own life and what gives them strength and attention and what holds them back and what are their opportunities to grow. So there's a lot of active coaching that, that lives in this space that's unique here, just given my disposition and so I'm really optimistic about codifying this stuff in some basic terms, in terms of a, of a curriculum or a syllabus and a manual, and then a, a, a larger scale invitation uh, to do something in the region and in the world. Um, but the tension that I'm weaving in that is, and this article speaks to that, if you'll get to that at some point, is siloed interventions aren't really what we need right now, necessarily. And that's just a view. Um, but, but we actually need to figure out how do we, how do we treat the entire global human system as one phenomenon that we are impacting homeopathically. And so I'll just finish by saying what's been resonating with me as we've been approaching this conversation is it's all palliative care. <laughs> We're all dying here. We're all suffering here. It's, there, there's nobody that's excluded. It's all palliative care. And so how can we bridge practical, relevant today's meaningful understandings of palliative care and um, and honor those spectrums of chop wood, carry water, sweep the floors, tend the wounds, and we're building something for a species in transition uh, that 
needs new tools that are more holistic and are more globally focused and locally practiced. So that's, I hope that's a handoff right there. Yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot. I, I will add a couple, um, you know, let me know if this sounds like it might work for this, but as things surface about Medicare, I can add a little bit of, about the corollary or contrast in palliative care. Um, and then we can sort of, you know, find our way um, to the, the overlap or the translation or both. Um, it occurred to me as you're talking, um, and I, as I'm taking notes, I've kind of got two columns and then <laughs> some stuff in the middle. And uh, palliative care really is the only specialty that um, where the care is uh, largely focused to the patient's daily existence and the attention on, you know, what's going to um, promote and support the utmost well-being, uh, just as you laid out on a, a daily, you know, just the person's life. Whereas every other specialty and even sort of generally general medicine specialties focus on what are these specific interventions that I can do that will impact, hopefully, the patient's overall daily life. But those interventions are not focused to um, the, the asking the questions of what does the daily life look like and how can we focus the interventions to support that. So I think that's one nice um, whole area, you know, just thinking even beneath that in, in Medicare. Um, okay, we're talking about daily, day-to-day -day existence for a person in this system. What are those needs? And of course, they'll vary. Um, but the, you know, the idea that there would be um, multiple other individuals involved in one person's well-being, daily well-being, um, I think just that structure alone is an interesting frame for what it means to uh, provide services, care services uh, for, for daily living, for up, utmost well-being and daily living. Um, the second is this kind of um, systemic mm, nature, I guess. Um, you know, I, I agree wholeheartedly uh, with the view that siloed interventions, they're just limited. Um, and a lot of times we get it wrong because we aren't considering uh, much beyond this kind of single moment in time or particular kind of intervention and not in the whole schema or system ecosystem of a person's life. Um, but palliative care is also an, another really interesting specialty that interacts with all, all other services. And um, there are a few medical specialties like that, but um, it's very much serves a I don't, I don't know. I mean, Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you're able, but um, I don't know that it's a quarterback function. I think some palliative care doctors and, and situations would serve that role if, um, you know, if the situation called for the, the palliative care team to kind of be making the shots um, overall, then potentially, and that all other services could the deferring, you know, the offering opinions about what might be optimal in their view, but then palliative decides how that will go in terms of the care plan. Um, but then even if they're not acting as quarterback, every other service, um, they need to collaborate in some way because if, you know, they just have to have an idea about what's actually reasonable for the patient considering all of the other conditions. And, um, that really isn't too common for medicine unless it's a you know more general medicine specialty that is um, more typically interacting with other specialists and trying to synthesize all of that information. But I really like that. Um, I, I think just the, the the very basic nature of the field um, is much more holistic and systemic than or systems based than than other specialties. I have a question. So if they if this if the if the field of palliative, of palliative care is inherently collaborative, 
but all of the other departments that they collaborate with are not inherently collaborative? How does that work? <laughs> Better and worse, as you might guess. Um, I think one of the wonderful things that I've seen, you know, even in um, the course of my training has been the um, pretty big shift in respect uh, toward palliative care. Um, and this is part of the research I'd like to dig into a little bit and talk to some colleagues more explicitly about. Um, and I'd love to see how some of those, um, you know, more typically on the, the further ends of the spectrum around, say, not as collaborative, not as humanistic or mm -hmm. apparently interested in, um, you know, the, the more um, relationship and, and behavioral aspects of care. Um, but I know for certain, even some of those fields are starting to develop this respect because um, it makes such a difference in patient care. And those kinds of outcomes in terms of just how comfortable people are in the, the worst conditions, you know, how better their pain is controlled, how other medications they have to take, how much easier and better I hate the word adherence, but you guys know what I mean. Um, that is, and you know, all the many other practical elements are that that work a lot better when we um, or when the the care um, strategy is more palliative, uh, similar to how palliative does things. And then they're, they tend to be, you know, I hate to overgeneralize, but like the people who are drawn to the field are the most compassionate, really great communicators. Um, you know, they're some of the most shining humanists in the field usually. And they have a way of working with difficult people, <laughs> difficult other specialties. So, um, you know, that also really helps. They're, you know, they're willing they are often sitting in the midst of, you know, pretty complicated cases and dealing with a lot of different specialists. And so they're really skillful about doing that. And, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions, but um, I think that that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, it, it, you have to, <laughs> takes a special personality, I think, to want to try to even wrangle a bunch of different doctors, especially specialists. <laughs> Is that helpful? Yes. And I, I think you hit on quite a few, I, I think, really interesting terms and concepts just to bubble them in, right? Like, so you're getting into collaborative, humanistic, relational focused. Uh, systems thinking, you're getting into, um, you know, recognizing even when you're trying to speak with others, like a solid, robust communication and communicators, uh, capacity to work with difficult people and, and work through that complexities. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, I think, really nice frames and terms that I think we can be pulling from from that. But uh, th that was that was really great, Dion. Thank you for that. Yeah. So I just want to say also that this is really, this conversation is really a foundation for all of us in Apollo in, in the challenges that we face. Like this is ultimately like um, meta META, like it's like a meta conversation, <laughs> Medicare for meta Apollo. Now, it is meta, that type of meta care is what, uh, what uh, Kabir says, so he can see why. <laughs> meta on many levels. <laughs> I, you know, we've so far... Echo, uh, some, all the stuff that Dion was saying, sorry, I'm, I've been en route to Kabir's house right now, actually. But um, the palliative care, it, she's totally spot on about every everything that you can, like, you can don't want to overgeneralize, but you take any doctor that you know that's in palliative care, you're like, wow, that's just a great doctor. They're very compassionate and humanistic. They care about the patient and the whole family and the whole system that patient lives in. And I remember I would get in trouble in the hospital because most of the time when you do a consult for a palliative care specialist, it's really just to control their pain. That's what a lot of the specialists are trying to do. They're like, I don't know how to control this pain, so call pain medicine and send the palliative care team in. Or it's kind of like, oh, wow, this, this patient has like cancer metastasized everywhere. I don't know what else to do. Call palliative care. And so they, 
they kind of swoop in and, and save the day a lot. And they work with the social workers hand in hand and they work with all the different types of resources that are out there to take care of the patient from, you know, a 360 degree point of view. And I remember as an intern, I was getting in trouble because I called palliative care for every patient that hit the <laughs> hospital. <laughs> you think you need, they need pain medicine and palliative care. Like they're like, you're over consulting them. You can't do that. And I'm like, well, the system is set up for them to be suffering. Like, why can't they, why can't we make that palliative care team more busy? You know, it's like the same thing in the philosophy of hospice, right? You, hospice is a wonderful resource. And, you know, I remember during my hospice rotation, our the, the attending is like, why don't we have hospice for the living? And she actually tried to create that for, you know, a program and it really was successful, but like, you know, surrounding the, the patient with all these wonderful resources at all times. Like, you know, that's where we're kind of getting into the systems thinking how to change the system a little bit, but those are just some of my thoughts here. Great. Yeah. And I'll, I'll I don't know if I could, yeah. if I can jump in really quick, I'm, I'm literally on another high design sprint, but this is, I'd love to do a, a deep dive because I've been working with five of the top palliative physicians in the United States. Um, I'm doing a conversational design sprint with them currently, and there is a lot of good information here that I'm, I'm listening in, half listening in, but um, to my, when people ask me about palliative, what I will say is it's whole person care. It is the only whole person. The difference between that and other, uh, uh, when you're in a critical care situation is that they're, being, they're treating organs, not the whole person. That's kind of how I describe it quickly to people. And uh, you're right, it, 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 ha it is driven by the desire to always speak to a qualitative goals of care application. And it is driven by the needs and the desire of the uh, patient and what they want and how this team can help to get them there. And it's, you know, obviously it's not driven by cure and things like that. Um, but I'm digging it, loving it. Um, as I said, there's so much that I, that I would love to, to share about what that is. And there is a system out of uh, Brigham's and of course, uh, Mayo. Mayo does it the best. They've been, they take about a two year approach, very high touch uh, care position with patients. It's, it's unbelievable the work they do. And then of course, I'm working with a, um, a couple folks, including BJ Miller and Shoshana Ungeleiter and Jessica Zitter um, on this approach. So love to kind of, jump in but I, I'm literally in this other sprint I just want to be able to listen in and so cool and yes 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 and um, I will try to listen to the recording. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much Heidi. That, I'm just going to springboard off of that a little bit because I would say that the thing I heard there that is exactly yes Medicare and the intersection there that I can see between that and palliative care is that you said it's it's whole person care. Medicare is whole system care like everybody in the system is explicitly receiving care. There isn't just any one patient in the sense that, that I said earlier, it's all palliative care and this is a palliative care planet. We're all living that right now. And so one of the things that was true here when, when we were really digging into this humming the most is that both David and I had different approaches to coaching that were just implicit in our beings that would nurture the people around us into uh, the identity of co-leadership so that everybody is leading one another into being whole person cared for. And, and when that's the theme of this, the care field, the care system, then the person who's traditionally identified at the pa as the patient, you see that expressed in them most visibly because they're the one with the most obvious weaknesses. Like, you know, Kabir is getting fewer infections and fewer hospital visits. But the reason isn't just the linear care going to Kabir or the whole person care going to Kabir, but it's the whole person care that's happening in all of the five or six or seven or eight people that are coming and going in and out of that field on a weekly basis. That's, go ahead. Yeah, please do. I'm, I'm just scribbling furiously, um, and I, I don't, I'm not sure I have anything really profound to say, uh, articulate at the moment, but I'm, I'm really gonna focus and, and 
pursue that aspect from the view of the kinds of writing usually that are done are done from physicians talking about their own experiences of healing per se or growth or benefits um, by being with patients you know and there are many prominent people um, taking either you know full writing a full book about this or a Speaking about it, Abraham Bergesi is one who's done so beautifully um, in various writings. But um, that's, a, in my opinion, a huge, unique differentiator here to really focus on and um, and expand on. I think not only from you know how are how do the trainees, for example, if we're going to talk about getting career services in a way that um, trainees can provide them with and, and get the training experience while Kabir is cared for on some practical levels. Um, that is part of it, of course, but there's a, a another currency here that you're speaking of that is just, it, there's nothing like this. Um, you know, I think some of the, the, uh, the physician humanists that are focusing on this will talk about it in different ways and talk about being healed um, through patients, through their, their care experiences and, and allowing themselves to be receptive to that and going in very intentionally um, to receive that kind of change. And then others come to it, um, you know, not on purpose at all, but like, whoa, what just happened, you know, it was totally changed by this experience in a way that um, it, it had nothing to do with, and I'm speaking as a physician saying this, that, you know, we often go into the care experiences feeling like um, we're, it's the one-way care street, you know, where I'm providing something that this person needs and um, I benefit because I'm happy that I helped them and they feel better, but it this kind of reciprocal nature that I think you're speaking of where um, the physicians are profoundly changed by the person and are open to having that experience. Um, I would love to, uh, I don't know, highlight, but, but make that a guiding force, I guess, for this and how different it is from anything else. I don't know the language, especially to speak to physicians that um, is best for that, but I think there is some that was, this is really great. I think we're definitely hitting on the Rosetta Stone goals here. So both seeing the similarities and the distinctions, if I can maybe throw in a few words that I'm feeling and sensing, and I'd love to just get people's reaction to it. Uh, this is building on conversations I've had with Frank Rogers, who's a, a friend, colleague of mine, who just runs a center for compassion up in LA. Um, and in particular, one of, the, one of the conversations he and I were having about was the difference between empathy and compassion. And in particular, when he was starting to bring up empathy, he was starting to really head on how a lot of times the physicians play the role of empathy, but they don't actually play the role of compassion. Um, and how that's a very hard space to put any person or human being into. And the reason why he was getting at it is that empathy is a thing where you're basically, it becomes a life draining exercise of empathy, where you're trying to take it on and you're trying to engage with someone in a, in a way such that you can you know, sit in somebody else's shoes, right? But compassion when you're doing it well is uh, at least the way that frank frames it is a life affirming energy it is something that brings that it that does come back to you and, and you start building this resonance and this flow between each other and oftentimes he says particularly when it comes to healthcare providers because they are put into this quote role of caretaker or provider and they're being paid for it and they have all these layers of roles and role models set up you're, you're actually building a structure that keeps, that makes it almost impossible to care because you think your job is to empathize um, and that you can't possibly benefit from it without being selfish. Uh, and just how life destructive that is of to not be able to be fully present and immersed in the, in the fact that you are part of the care and love and compassion that is creating space for healing. So I, that's sort of what I was hearing with what you were just describing, Deanna. I don't know if that would resonate or like as a, as a seed of the language for us to think through. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, and there's some good research and, um, you know, more um, uh, articulation of those differences and how we go about training physicians and nurses and others so that we don't run into 
um, empathy fatigue, which is really burnout, and even compassion fatigue, which I still am, I think that sometimes people use compassion, but they really mean empathy, and um, that the specific training around compassion, in my experience of it, is, is exactly what you've said through meditation or ever even more, um, you know, less, uh, how to say it, um, introspective practices are, is, is really um, energizing. And, and you feel like this, you know, I don't know, endless, but a very deep well of, um, of yes. being able to be present with people no matter what their circumstances. So um, agree so much. Um, I also wanted to add to that, oh, something that I've forgotten. Um, that the, what I think too, what you're describing is, um, empathy is, is not as empowering for people as compassion is by far, right? Because you're, the assumption is, you know, the person needs me and if they need you, <laughs> then what kind of differential are you setting up from the very beginning? And maybe not just you, but they- life draining, yeah, right? It, right? It, it, and, is I am giving you, I am- Versus understanding the dynamic. That's exactly. Sorry, that's exactly. No, no. Yeah, great. Um, I even wrote about a, an essay about this as a medical student. I'm going to see if I can drag that up, but because um, I was so mad about it, especially I saw it tons on psychiatry because you know the assumption was always that these people are so incapacitated from being able to live independently, and it was just you know, depressing even for me as a trainee because I could, I felt like I saw the life drained out of the patients feeling like, you know, we're so capable on so many levels. Why are you treating us um, with so much um, condescension? And so uh, I would love to focus on that part too. Just to take it back to etymologies for a minute, compassion is to suffer together to suffer with, which you know, we have to step into that recognition that I'm suffering if I'm going to have compassion. Can we take the suffering out of it? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a good question. <laughs> Isn't that the question? Yeah. The Buddha on my screen here says yes, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a, a quote on the wall behind me that I may have shared before, but it's uh, attributed to I think an Australian indigenous elder um, that says if you're coming here to help me don't bother. But if you're coming because you recognize that our liberation and our evolution is bound together, then let's work together. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think you can even draw a lot of parallels in Heidi. Um, I don't, she's not here still, but uh, I hope that as she, you know, we continue to talk about this further, I think all of her work and gerontology is the same. You know, we, we have such um, this, you know, disrespect or or sense of you know treating like children out our elders and i shouldn't even say like children because you can have the same conversation with children that why do we create this differential is really what it gets to we should um you know not have that from the provider side in my opinion that if we start in this ecosystem as you're envisioning it where the the beginning place is um you are not the giver, however, you know, we want to say this, but there's an equality and equity that starts from the very beginning. And that if you're participating in the ecosystem, you are both giver and receiver. And if I may, if it's, unfortunately, I'm going to need to jump off at our Me too. Time. Me too. So sorry. Okay. No, no, but at least we had a chance to have this quick sync and I think we should continue this. So throwing in a, maybe we can just all do a little reflection on this then just so, so we can all process this a little bit and say what, what kind of insight we have. The insight I'm hearing from this is um, one, that there are languages from palliative care that we can build on, but there's also, I think, a clear differentiator that we can establish. And we started even getting that language with sort of whole person care versus whole system care. Uh, and I think that actually is also the key nexus on the hunch that I had, that, that Kabir's quote unquote weakness is his greatest strengths. You know, the fact that like he is a co-leader. He is like, it's not this idea that when you care for Kabir, you are going to be life drained. You are going to be life filled through this process. You know, it's a life affirming act and it's a life affirming process for everyone. And, and, I, and so I think that there's something uniquely powerful about Kabir as a person, your lived experience, 
um, and your capacity to be able to help people to feel and learn that distinction. And I think I could imagine us actually gathering that language and that discourse based on all the people that have cared for you in the past to sort of start from the seed of palliative care of whole person, zoom out and say, this is what we're at. We're like palliative care, yes, but we're focusing on the system. And the key flip is that the patient is not a patient. The patient is, you know, we, it's, it's what you were just getting at, you know, and I, I, I'm, that's sort of where I'm seeing an interesting language in terms of setting up a training model that I think could be very inviting to a lot of people and getting into the compassion versus, the, you know, I think we can get into those subtle areas, but that seems to be the sort of thesis statement I'm hearing right now about Medicare for communication. And to just to reinforce Jess, that's exactly why it's the foundation for Apollo, in my opinion. It's, you know, I think that equity is the same premise that, um, you know, there, there's this, differential, power differential built into the doctor-patient relationship that is part of the problem, if not, you know, most of the problem. Right, and that system sort of breaks them, right? So you can't, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's physically possible for any human being to have deep compassion every 15 minutes for a new person. Um, it's, that, that's hard, you know? So. Well it is easier than empathy, though. And, and I, I, I I disagree. Really? Actually, completely. Yeah. But that seems like an interesting layer for us to dig into at some point. So. Sure. Yeah. Dennis, you've been quiet. I'd love to just hear where your head's at. And then Kabir, maybe you can have our last word. I'm, I'm practicing self-compassion <laughs> by, uh, <laughs> by catching some lunch. Uh, just got in from uh, VIP with Jan. And uh, I wanted to be a fly in the wall here. But uh, I don't have a lot to say. I, 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 I hear what's being said, especially about someone taking the professional role of, of money for caregiving. And one of the things that sticks in my, makes me very uncomfortable is that those people are expected to do enormously valuable work for such a substandard wage to be so uh, marginalized um, that $15 an hour is, is the expected wage. And um, Kabir and I have talked about this a bit too. It's my understanding that when the minimum wage laws and 40 hour week laws went into effect back in the um, Roosevelt administration, caregivers were intentionally um, excluded because they were primarily women of color. And uh, they have always been disenfranchised since. They have not been covered the same way other workers are covered. So um, I think there's something there for us to consider as well, um, simply because it's such so unjust to ask people to do such difficult and important work and yet be marginalized. Uh, so off the top of my head, that's what I've got, guys. Pretty powerful, Dennis. I appreciate that. Mike, I don't know where you are. I saw you in the house. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm outside, actually, getting some fresh air. I'm looking at myself oh, there you on are. your screen. The window, yeah. Yeah. This is, this, is, this is totally meta right now. <laughs> where's Kirisu? <laughs> yeah, where's, where's Waldo? There he is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mike, I'd love to just hear your thoughts and then Kabir can have our last word. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with everything here and I, I know we're circling around this. I'm just looking for practical ways to keep move, pushing this forward. So I'm almost done with the wireframe of writing this up as like an elective rotation for medical students. Like uh, the, the hard thing with medical students, you only have their attention for four weeks and they're on to the next the next rotation. And so trying to build it in where they can come in for and just spend time here for four weeks. And what, what is it, what is the goals and objective that they can learn during that period of time? So it's kind of compressing a lot of the stuff, but I think it can be done. I'm working with my friend, she's the director of palliative care at University of Wisconsin to, to try to get this out. And it could be an elective that we can get, try to get up and running, hopefully within you know a, a few months time, it has to get approved by certain departments, but we can push that through. And, you know, again, iterating on like what other students might we want to get here it's not just medical students so that's why i put that back out to like yeah. this could be a design issue and like come to the house and design something like 
whiteboard it out. Like, what do we need to do different? Bring all your sticky notes and pins and all those design elements that people love to work with. And I think there's some really practical things we can get going here. But I, I'll, as soon as I finish that draft of the wireframe of what the rotation would look like, I'll send it out to everybody. And well, Eric, I'm, I need to I need to understand where the snooze button is on my inbox because I'm. I know I gotta use that. That's, that sounds it's great. Really handy. Yeah. I, I have it. It's in Gmail. If you're using Gmail, but. Um, I, I, maybe some. Anyway, other those are my thoughts. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kabir. Thoughts last. Yeah, I just um, you know, Dennis reminded me of the importance and and uh, you know, Dion, you mentioned earlier currencies. Um, it's you know wellness in a, in a being whether it's a collective or an individual has to do with the robust circulation of all the natural currencies of that organism and um and i really like this this frame that heidi helped me see this the connected palliative care and mental care um how do we use that lens of whole being care and then scale it the whole systems care and uh, so how to circle these things back around I guess that's what's landing me I'm not a prodigious note taker I, I wonder I try to let that black hole in my soul like drink in all of this and then emit it in the proton streams coming out the top and the bottom when I sit down to do something and um, yeah, so I'm just really energized by this conversation, excited. Um, I, I meant to mention earlier, but Patience is sitting right here just to my left, who's just finished her lunch and listening and is oh. one of my on the ground kind of lead collaborators with Metacare right now. Hi, and, Patience. Hi. And so I'm really glad that she got to sit here and listen to this. And, you know, I want to see it come through when I can break through this moment of transition where we've got focusing really on getting the coffee grinder working and the kitchen clean and these things and me up and out of bed functionally. I get back into the curriculum design. I'm really looking forward to seeing how do these things circulate through and what are the different care currencies as David's been working on and how we bring all that into looking at the kind of palliative awareness of all of the beings in the system and, and you know it's not just suffering but actually growing. Like how do we What's, what's the evolutionary side? Like, come be here because this is all about us evolving together, our, our liberation and our... How do we build the life-affirming energies? Say again? Life-affirming energies. How do yeah. we start thinking about that versus so much of it being life-draining? Yeah. Thank you all. Oh, it's always great being with you guys. Sorry, I need to jump on. But thank you. Um, Yay. Hey, everyone. Good to see you, Eric.